morning to welcome all of you here. Um, we're excited to be together this morning, to have the opportunity to worship together. I want to especially welcome you if you are new or if you're visiting. Um, you might not know it, but there's a reason why you're here this morning, and I'm really excited for you. Um, let's take some time right now just to stand up and greet each other, um, welcome each other, and shake some hands. Well, last week might have been Easter, but Christ is still risen indeed today. And we have just as much reason to celebrate today as we did last week. So let's lift up our voices together and let's worship our Savior, for He is risen.
turn our hearts to you and call upon your name. You are the one who is and who was and who is to come. And worthy is your name to receive all glory, honor, thanks, and praise. For there is none like you in heaven above or on earth below. As the scriptures say to you, Lord, the bright morning star, the root and descendant of David, you are the one who is worthy. We love you, Jesus. So receive our praise. And, and Lord, we pray that you would tune our hearts and tune our ears to hear your word and your gospel to us today. We love you. In your great name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, please be seated. And I want to give a special welcome from, from me. It's really good to have all of you here today. Uh, it's good. Last Sunday was good, and God's got a great Sunday for us together as well. Uh, I want to draw especially your attention to this little, oops, there, got it right set up. This communication card in your worship program. Uh, this is a way to stay connected and get connected. And if you've been uh, around here for a little while, it's an opportunity to stay connected. On the back side, anybody can request a prayer or find a little information. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about that in, in a minute. But if you're new with us, and this is your first Sunday with us this morning, I want you to fill this out. And there's a welcome table out uh, to, the, to your right out here in the fellowship hall. And they've got a little small gift for you. Uh, to take home just as, hey, we're glad that you came here this morning. But bring that. We want to build a relationship. We're not going to spam you, okay? 
We're not going to dump a bunch of junk mail in your mailbox at home. But we want to you know, build a relationship with you if you could. Now, on the back side of this, I want to just a little attention. This summer, our outreach team is, is working diligently to prepare some uh, outreach projects. And if you've got an idea, you can drop your idea here uh, on the line. You can put these in the, in the uh, offering bag as it passes later on, or you can bring it out to the welcome table as well. Uh, we need some ideas. If you need prayer, uh, you can request prayer there. Those will go to me. If it's confidential, you need to make sure you mark it as confidential on the front side. But this is an opportunity to stay connected and get connected. And if you're a newcomer, again, bring that to the welcome table. We've got a nice little uh, gift for just being. Thank you for just blessing us with your presence here this morning. Hey, there's a lot of neat things. There's a lot of neat things that God is doing here. And one of the things that God continues to do is bring new people. And he brings people to first through all sorts of means and methods. Sometimes he brings new babies, and boy, we've got a whole bunch of them have come, and a whole bunch of them on their way still. Sometimes God brings new people, uh, just they move into town, and sometimes God shuffles this, the deck of, you know, of who he's got where, and, and he does that. Sometimes you know, God moves upon people's hearts and causes them to believe, and sometimes people get married, and they join a church through that. We need to welcome a newcomer with us this morning. Brittany, where are you? Brittany, 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 hold your, oh, there you are, okay, so Brittany is transferring her membership from uh, the Lutheran Church in Boyden, is that correct, Brittany? Oh, and Hall, excuse me, and uh, we got just a little bit of a welcome bag here for you, there's some goodies, just to say we love you, and we're sure glad you're made a home here at first, of course, it, was, it helped a lot that you married a good man, too, who grew up in the church, but let's just welcome Brittany with love encouragement. And for any of us, any time, you know, to, and to be a member of the church is to say, I'm committing myself to the life of this body of, uh, of Christ here, um, but we also commit ourselves to publicly living out our faith in Christ. Everybody's welcome, but then sometimes God calls us deeper and causes us to make that deeper commitment to a local congregation spot. We're grateful to have you, Brittany. Uh, there's lots of other things that are happening. I just got to find my notes here to make it all together. Uh, so, on April 19th, uh, you need to come, ladies, you sh should come to the Taste and See event that's happening. Uh, you need to sign up by next Sunday. Uh, it's April 19th. It's going to be at 7 p.m., a ladies' event. I, I, I'm not a part of any of that for obvious reasons. But Joellen tells me it's going to be excellent, so anticipate that as well. Uh, this coming Friday night at 6 p.m., and Saturday morning at 9 p.m. It'll be, it is the first workshop that we are hosting in the Congregational Vitality Pathway. This is the discern, start of the discernment process that we're asking God. What is your call on this congregation for the next you know, period of years? And Lord, what is your plan for us? It begins this Friday night. You're all invited, but you need to make a little RSVP. So you can give Carla a phone call in the office or you can return that little, sh that little sheet you had and that little slip you had in your mailbox a few weeks ago. You can return that. Or just give her a call. That's fine. Let her know that you're coming. Write an email if you want to. Uh, we need just a head count because at, at 6 o'clock on Friday, there's going to be a meal. And we'll have a little breakfast time as well on Saturday morning. Um, make your plans according. Really love to have all, as many people who can be there as can. And then finally, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, out in the fellowship hall by the boxes, there's, there's a... Um, a new newsletter that's come out. Draw your attention there. But with the newsletter is also a call to prayer. Uh, our denomination, the Reformed Church in America, is at a critical time of discerning a very important issue with respect to human sexuality, and we're being called to prayer. So this little packet with the little with the um, newsletter is out there. Please take that home, and I want you to join me in praying that God's will certainly will be done, but according to His will and certainly his word as well. So I want you to join me in prayer for that. If you need to know or like to know more information, please just give me a, give me a call and we'll sit down for a time to powwow and talk those things over. So um, there's lots of great things happening. Let's turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Please pray with me. Lord, we love you and we lift our hearts to you. God, there's people we need to pray for today who, who are in need of your help. Uh, Lord, we remember Darla and, and Dixon Van Matron and, uh, and the death of Darla's mother. 
uh, Artie Van Clay. And we ask, God, that you would give to this family your peace, that you would give to this family your comfort. Your word says that you are the Father of comfort, the God of compassion. So show them, Lord, the comfort that you have shown to us. Because many of us around this room today have tasted the, the awful pains of grief and the loss of, of a loved one. And Jesus, I pray that you will come and bring your comfort to this family today. But also, Lord, hold out to them the hope that is found in your son as well. And so we lift them up before you. God, we pray for Elaine Getzlaff. You know, she had you know, last weekend the opportunity to go home, but it was only there for you know, a short period of time. And Jesus, we pray now that she's gone to the senior care and is in hospice. Lord, her prayer is that you would take her home. And so we're going to honor that. And Lord, pray that you will take Elaine home to be with you. And thank you that you, you give believers all confidence to face our, our own demise, our own death, not with fear, not with trembling, but with confidence that comes from you and you only. And that is, that is you know, Elaine's experience now and that of Khan, her husband. But Lord, soon you'll, he'll be left alone as well, and we pray that you'll give your peace and your comfort to him. But use us, Lord, in the great care and love of God's, your family here, to comfort Elaine, especially comfort Khan. God, we bring them before your throne, and we bring before you our brother Thel Boone, too. Lord, Thel is going in for a procedure for, for his, uh, uh, his gallbladder. You know, he's got some issues there, and on Tuesday that's going to be addressed. We pray for good news, and that you will bring healing to him. And he can be able to eat well again and have strength for his body. But as we look around the room, and Lord, we're seated next to individuals, some of them we know, some of them we may not know, but Lord, each of us are carrying some degree of, of burden or struggle. You know, that might be with a family member, Lord, who's um, we're just out of relationship with, and we've been fighting with them for some time. And Lord, we don't know what to do next to bring about peace and reconciliation for which we pray that you would bring it. Some of us, Lord, are, you know, we, need, we need work or employment, and we pray that you would answer, hear our cry for, for your provision for us. Some of us, Lord, you know, we are burdened down by the weight of depression. We don't like it. We don't know what to do about it. Or, or Lord, we struggle with the effects of this mental illness generally. Jesus, we pray that you would stretch out your hand and save and deliver and rescue as only you, O oh God, can do. Lord, we each come into the room today with heaviness on our hearts for something or someone. And you say in your word, cast all of your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Your word says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, present your request to God. So we bring our requests, Lord, here to you generally, but move upon our hearts that what, as we pray now, we may continue to pray in the coming weeks for ourselves, but Lord, for others as well. And Lord, as your people, as your people, make us praying people then, and when someone opens the gap in their heart and exposes the pain within, allow us with all sensitivity and tenderness to ask if we can pray. And, and for those whom we do pray, whose hearts are, are weighed down with heaviness and hurt, Christ, we pray that you will break your kingdom into their life and bring healing or relief or uh, reconciliation or to take that burden away. Lord, use us. Hear the prayers of your people as they call upon you. Lord, we lift our prayer to you. We love you. And throughout the week, move upon our hearts to continue to call us to prayer. We love you, Lord. As we sing again, we're, we just thank you that you are our chief cornerstone. You are the firm foundation upon which we can stand.
But as that cornerstone, Lord, you reorient our lives to know what is right and wrong. You reorient our lives to know that which is fleeting and failing in this world and to that which is everlasting. Lord, you set our lives aright. We just thank you that you are our cornerstone. And on you and you alone can we solidly stand in this world. So we bring our praise to you still, Christ, and minister to us as we sing. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. As we continue to worship, we would like to welcome you to stand and sing with us. Please be seated, friends. Saying, if you're a child and if you are four years old, 
or in kindergarten, you may go to children in worship. All right. Thank you, kids, for coming to see us. Miss Diane is in the back. She will take you down. Parents, if you need to find your kids afterwards, uh, you can find me, and I'll help you get in the right direction. It's room 21 in the basement if you would like to find your kids, if you want to take them home with you, if you want to. All right. Well, friends, we've got a really special uh, time together with God and His Word this morning. Uh, would you please turn with me in your copy of the Scriptures to Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to put our hearts and minds' attention to verse 12 through verse 25. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12 through verse 25. Now, the Lord has some really neat things to show us in the next several weeks, and we're going to have a little bit of fun. And uh, I'm very excited for what the Lord is doing. He's, we're starting a new ser uh, series today. You know, I'm, I title it Heaven on Earth. And I've been put, it's been really hard for me to put it together, but it's been a great joy because I want to make sure we're really clear and, and accurate what uh, God wants us to say. But, you know, I want to think together with you through this series. And the great grand vision that God is showing us through His Word. Now, everybody has an opinion or a thought about heaven. And I'm sure that you've got some thoughts or, you know, and ideas about heaven itself. And uh, well, we're going to put those, we're going to lay those at the feet of the Lord and let us hear what he has to say. But, but like I said, everybody's got a thought on, on heaven. Do you know this name, Belinda Carlisle? Do you know, do you know, you, you've pro if you don't know the name, you probably know the famous song that she sung. Now, I'm going to probably age myself a little bit here, but do you remember the days of going to the roller skating rink? I sure wish we still had our roller roulette. That was so awesome. I remember the days of going to the roller skating rink, Friday night, you know, the, the, the disco ball in the center and the lights flashing here and there and all over and, you know, loud music. Not bad music. There was a song that kind of touched my heart uh, when I was a kid. Um, oh boy, now I've, I gotta sing it. Maybe it's better that I don't sing it, because it's a woman sang it. Oh, here we go. It, it, you remember the song? I think it's called Heaven on. Um, nope. What? Yeah. Oh, I forget it about it. I'm sorry. Heaven is a. No, that's another song. Nope. What? Ooh. Yeah, sing it. Sing it, shall we? Ooh, baby, you know that's where. Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. I've been singing that song for like a week. And I finally went on YouTube like, who sang that song? Now you probably don't, you may, not, you may know that song, you may not know that song. But your teenager probably sang that song. When I think of that song, I take him back to the roller skating rink and I'm doing laps thinking about this pretty girl. You know... Belinda Carlisle has an opinion on heaven. And that whole song is about, you know, this, these, you know, lovey-dovey, teeny-boppy, you know, feelings she has, you know, for a boy or something like that. And she has an opinion on heaven. And we all kind of bring our thoughts to, uh, about heaven, but we're going to submit those to God's teaching and God's authority. But if you could generally say about Americans, there's probably two opinions generally. One, there is a heaven, or two, there isn't a heaven. But there's more to that than that. Obviously, God says there is heaven. But what's the truth? And, and today, you know, today, God wants to show us that his kingdom and his rule on earth was reestablished by Jesus and that the fullness or the completed work of that kingdom comes to fruition in heaven one day. So this is, this is where we need to start. And in fact, this is the thread that runs all the way through Scripture from the very beginning in Eden all the way to the end in Revelation 22 when Christ's kingdom has fully come. What Jesus came to establish comes to fulfillment in heaven one day. We're going to add to this, but this is where we're going to start. So the Scripture text is Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. Let's put our hearts and minds attention to it there. Now... When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Okay, just put that in the back of your mind a second. We're going to come back to it. 
He was in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea, along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all those who were ill with very diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across Jordan followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Gert, please, please pray us in. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you this morning for the bright sunshine and the beauty of your creation. And now, Lord, as we worship and we praise you, we ask that you fill Pastor Paul with the words you want to share with us. Open our hearts, our minds, our ears, close our mouth so that we may listen and hear what you have to share with us. Mm -hmm. We ask this all in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gert. Thank you. So what we need to know is God's kingdom and God's rule on earth was established by Jesus. And that comes to completion in the, when, heaven, when we see heaven in all of its fullness and all of its order and all of its detail. It comes to completion there. And it come, happens by the hand of the Lord Jesus. He's the one who makes it happen. And there's great things that are about to happen for us. But we need to see some truth that God brings to us out of the scriptures. So the first note I just wanted to make sure is this, that indeed God's kingdom and rule was reestablished by Jesus. But he does this through kind of three particular ways that I want us to see in the scripture text. The first thing is, when Jesus comes to do this work, he does it in a particular place. All right, draw your attention back to the page, to the scripture, to verse 13, but really kind of verse 15 as well. Jesus, when uh, John the Baptist had gone into prison, that signified John's ministry was over. Now it's Jesus' turn to take over. All right, he leaves Nazareth in verse 13, and he went to this place, Capernaum, which is a little town, uh, a little city on the northwest corner of the lake or the Sea of Galilee. Now, Capernaum is in a general region of two of the territories of two ancient tribes of Israel. Those names are Zebulun and Naphtali. These were, two, these were actually two guys. These were their names. One was Zebulun, one was Naphtali. They you know, had descendants, and the descendants of those people, when God gave them the promised land, were in these particular regions on sort of the west side and the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, the very place where Jesus is starting his ministry in this place called Capernaum. Now, if you go to a map of New Testament Palestine, you will not see Zebulun and Naphtali. But the Jewish people who are hearing these words that Matthew's writing, I mean, he's writing for the, Ma the Jewish people. The Jewish people would hear Zebulun and Naphtali, and boom, they know exactly what you're talking about because they would be very familiar with you know, Old Testament geography. You won't find them there today. However, it's important that we note where these places are because of the prophecy that's spoken in Isaiah. Verse 15, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali. Okay, the way to the sea along the Jordan. It kind of locates in Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 16, this is the key part. The people living in darkness, speaking of the people living in that land, have seen a great light. It's been dark and a light has come. Now this, on those living in the land of the shadow of death... A light has dawned. Now, I want to stop just for that little bit. In the land of living in the shadow of death, what does that possibly mean? Well, here it is. You got Zebulun, well, I wish I should have put this up on the screen for you. You got Zebulun and Naphtali on the northwest and west sides of, um, 
uh, the Sea of Galilee. Immediately to the north and a little bit to the east was another tribe by the name of Dan. And I won't go into all the details now, but through a series of events that happened, the Jewish people believed in the land of Dan was the very entryway into hell itself. Okay, this is what they believed, this is what they thought. Thus, these neighboring areas, Zebulun and Naphtali, were thought of living in the shadow of, in the shadow of the, the land of death, in the land of the shadow of death. They were in that area. So they're right next to it. So the first thing we know is Jesus specifically goes to this place in Capernaum that's in the shadow of death, and he's saying, boom, my kingdom is going to be established here. In fact, he goes further. When later on, while Jesus and his disciples are, are ministering, he goes to that very place, that very rock where they thought was the entryway into hell itself. And Jesus says, on this rock, not talking about Peter, he's talking about the rock on which he's standing, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus is establishing his kingdom in, quote unquote, enemy territory. That is spiritual enemy territory. He's building it there. That's the first thing we need to know when God is reestablishing his kingdom on earth. Second thing we need to know, not only a particular place, but the particular words that Jesus says in verse 17. From that time on, that is the time that he began to preach and teach, from that time on, Jesus began to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Let's just break those words down. The first word is repent. Repent is merely a turning away from one and turning to the other. In spiritual meaning, that means turning away from the way of the world, the way of sin, death, darkness, turning away from that, and thus turning and trusting in the Lord, trusting in Jesus. That's the meaning of repentance. So he's calling people, turn away from the kingdoms of the world and turn to the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is used there because Matthew doesn't want to offend the Jewish people and use the term kingdom of God, which Matthew, or Mark and Luke use. It's the same thing. God's establishing his kingdom, his heavenly rule, right here on earth. As God rules in heaven, he's establishing, or excuse me, reestablishing his kingdom rule on earth. Okay? And, but then, uh, it's these words near. Okay, Garrett, you've got to help me out. This is what you get for sitting close to the front of the room. Come stand up here with me. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, one way to think about near is, okay, it's nearly 1130, right? One way to think about it is chronologically, time. That's not the meaning here. The meaning is presence, physical presence. Garrett is near me. I am near Garrett, all right? Do you remember Grover from Sesame Street, kids? Can you do with me? Near? Okay, I won't do that too much longer. That was just for the kids' as entertainment so they can, I can stay with them, all right? I did that second or first service, and they, they didn't laugh nearly as much as you did. Thank you. I hoped you would. But that's the idea. Nearness, presence. Okay, thanks, Garrett. Okay, so what is he saying here? Not only he went to a particular place, but he's saying particular words to communicate that with Jesus comes the kingdom. It is near. I mean, it's right before your very eyes. But he backs that up with particular deeds and actions. Go down to verse uh, 23, 24, and 25. So Jesus is going around all throughout Galilee. He's teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. That is, through Jesus, God is reestablishing his kingdom on earth. And then the news spread everywhere. Uh, all over Syria, all over the region. And people brought to him... All who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe, the demon possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Now, if there's one thing we know about the truth of heaven, that there isn't any sickness, right? I mean, this is the testimony of Scripture. We know from Revelation 21, 22 that there is no more mourning, crying, or pain. What's the source of a lot of mourning, crying, or, or death? What's the source of mourning, crying, or pain? A lot of it is sickness. In heaven, God takes these bodies of ours and heals them. 
We had a wonderful conversation. I, I sat in uh, during a Sunday school hour with a, a group of older members of the congregation, and they looked forward to this great healing that God would bring. Some of them shared about their, loved, their, their, their spouse, their husband, their wife, who had gone before them to be with the Lord, and the healing that they experienced really through death, it gives them hope. If there's one thing we know about heaven is that God stretches out his hand and he heals. But boom, right here in the very midst of this ministry, when the kingdom of God has come near, here Jesus is, carrying out the signs of the kingdom. Paralyzed people can walk. Those who have diseases are healed. Those with severe suffering and pain are relieved. Uh, and, uh, did I get them all? There we go. The de oh, and the demon possessed. Those who are tortured and possessed by demons, they are set free. Jesus is reestablishing the kingdom of God, his reign and his rule here on earth. Now, the reason I say, the reason I say reestablished is because God's had this intention to work through people from the very beginning. Let's go over here. You know the story from Eden. God created the heavens and the earth, chapter uh, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, the Lord creates the garden in Eden. And that was intended, uh, oh, excuse me, when he created people, God gave them the command to have dominion over all creation. That is, uh, go and rule as I would rule. And that's the intention of being someone made in the image of God, that you would reign over the earth and rule over the earth as God himself would. That is, all humans, all together. But we know that failed because you go to Genesis chapter 3, you know, they eat the forbidden fruit, they have the knowledge of good and evil. Well, God didn't fail, but people failed. Then we see the Lord raises up, um, you know, the, the, uh, excuse me, the wickedness came in the land, and then the Lord raised up Noah, and then it was his descendants, but then they had the, the Tower of Babel. They rebel against the Lord because they want to get back to God, but God's saying, no, that's not the way it is. I come down to you. He gives up on them again. And then finally, he raises up Abraham and his descendants. And now, now this is the time. Now this is, the, this is it, when God's going to reestablish his rule. But every time we see human beings failing, so finally you get to Jesus, who himself is human, but not just any human but fully God at the same time. And he's reestablishing his kingdom rule. By the time you get to Revelation 21 and 22, you see this kingdom rule come to fruition in our very midst. Jesus establishes it, and it's going to happen. Now, this is what we need to see. So there's a thread that runs all the way through Scripture. God seeking his, to establish his kingdom rule, and he finally you know, so to speak, does it because he does it himself. Where people had failed, God comes to reestablish his reign and his rule. So, in the end then, okay, he went to a particular place, he said particular words. Here's the last thing. The kingdom comes in all of its completed order when Jesus finally returns again. I love the hope that we get here. All of the little things... All of the little things that give a little taste of the kingdom, all these times when Jesus healed various diseases, you know, healed people suffering in severe pain, the demon possessed, all of these things are little tastes of the kingdom. But there's going to be a day, a great and glorious day, when all things shall be made new. When the kingdom comes in all of its fullness, in all of its completed order, when Jesus Christ returns again. And through the human beings again, who are no longer tainted by sin, through human beings again, the rule of God is established over the entire earth when Jesus comes back. And until then, we get these little glimpses. We get little tastes, I, that's, that's what I kind of call them, of the kingdom that has come and still is coming. We have a little taste, a little flavor. I always think of Thanksgiving. And you walk in the door at mom's house at Thanksgiving and you smell the turkey. You smell the stuffing. You smell, you know, the, the, the uh, pumpkin pie. And you get a little whiff. And you know, you know what's coming. And every little time, one of these things breaks into the, into the present. 
we know that the kingdom is coming. I had somebody share this story. Marv, Marv actually gave me permission to share this story after first service. You know, many of you know Marv Ben Reason. Uh, Marv, uh, you know, part of this congregation has been for many, many years. Uh, Marv has a son, and I, I don't remember his name off the top of my head. Can someone help me out? Grant, Grant that's right, Grant. Two, about two years ago, Grant's wife was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And nearly all hope was lost for her. But they didn't give up hope. They still continued to trust the Lord. And they prayed, and they prayed. And in their church in, uh, in, in T in South Dakota, you know, they, they had a, a whole prayer time just dedicated asking God to stretch out his hand to heal this woman. I mean, she was on the last little bit. And you know what God did? And he doesn't do this every time. And I'm not sure why he doesn't do it every time. But he did it this time. He stretched out his hand. And Grant's wife was healed. In fact, just last week, she had a checkup. She's been going every three months for a checkup. And the, the cancer, it's still gone. What is that? That's a little healing, but it's a sign of the kingdom that breaks into the present. And these are just little tastes, little foretastes of, of, of the kingdom that has come and is coming into the world. It's the, it's the sign of the kingdom that will come in heaven in all of its fullness. When we won't have to deal with these things like diseases or pain. We won't have to deal with these things like cancer. We won't have to deal with things like heart disease. That'll be good because we all like our burgers and red meat, don't we? We won't have to deal with those things anymore. Because when his kingdom has fully come, those things are gone. We won't have to worry about death anymore. Because when his kingdom has fully come, there is no more death. Can you imagine that? Life for eternity? Imagine that for a second. We only know birth and life and death. But what happens when there's no more death? You just keep on going and going and going and going and going. Right now, we see just glimpses of the kingdom. Jesus was, you know, with Jesus, the kingdom was coming, and we still see it today. We see it with every person whose eyes are opened, and they come to believe, and God moves upon their hearts and to, to profess faith in the Lord Jesus. That's a sign of the kingdom. It continues to grow. And, and, uh, it, and it's still today. It started with Jesus, and it continues today. People continue to believe. People continue to be healed. People with diseases continue to be set free. I have heard, I've never experienced with my own self, uh, demon possession. Uh, I've, I've seen the effects of it, but I've never seen someone relieved of it. I have good friends who have been involved with that ministry, and people are saved and delivered from demon possession. God sets people free. His kingdom has been established, and his rule is spreading across the world. And we will see the fullness of that in heaven one day. Now, this is the foundation we need. To, when we think about heaven, this is the foundation we need. It's the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. When we see the fullness of heaven, it's on earth. It's heaven and it's earth, and they come together. Revelation 21 and 22. It's his kingdom on earth. Now, the next several weeks, we get an opportunity to explore the riches and depths of heaven we're also going to talk about the opposite of heaven, that is being hell itself. But I want us to give a foundation here today. So let's talk about this word. What do we got to do to put it to practice in our own lives? Here's the first thing. I want you to enter into God's kingdom and, the, and receive the promise of heaven by repentance and trust in Jesus Christ. I want you to turn away from whatever you're trusting in, whatever hopes that you have for just a good life, I want you to trust in Jesus Christ. Number one, you've got to recognize that I've sinned and fallen short. Number two, recognize that Jesus was my, my sacrifice on the cross for my sin. And trust in him. Like we might trust our spouse to carry, go to the store and, and buy the list of groceries. We trust in Jesus that he's done everything for us already on the cross. I want you to enter into God's kingdom and the promise of heaven by repentance and trust in Jesus today. Now, why today? Because we don't know if we'll have a tomorrow. Well, I might have a tomorrow, 
but you might not have tomorrow. I and mean, you might have it tomorrow, but I may not have it. We don't know if we, any of us has a tomorrow. We only know what we have right now. And it's time to respond. It's, it's time to turn away and repent and trust in Jesus. It's time. Today's the day. Scripture says, today is the day of salvation. Friend, it is for you today. That's the first thing I want you to do. And if you're making that decision today to follow Jesus, I wanna, I'd like to meet you I, and help you along the path, and help you to grow in this re new relationship with Christ. Here's the second thing. I want you to follow Jesus to establish, to, you know, really to help establish his kingdom on earth. I didn't make any mention so far about James and John and Peter and Andrew, but they're a key part of this story. Between Jesus saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is, is near, and him, in the summary of all the things that he did, you have the story of Jesus calling these guys with him. They have no clue what they're getting into. I think they have a little clue, but they have no clue of the fullness. But what do we see about these guys? They walk along with Jesus for a period of years, we see them then learning what they know, learning what they do from Jesus, whether that be healing people, we see them doing that. When uh, we, we see them teaching people, they're doing that. We see them, you know, after Jesus has died and, and risen from the grave and ascended back to the Father, the Spirit comes down, we see them teaching and leading the church. We see them doing the same work Jesus did, establishing God's kingdom here on earth. Now, we often think of these guys, Peter and James, or Peter and Andrew, James and John, like heroes or something. Believe me, they were just like us, pretty ordinary people. For instance, they're sitting in the boat when Jesus calls them. They're just regular guys. And it, that's what God does. He takes regular guys and uses them for his kingdom work. I want to give you a couple stories, quick stories. Number one, uh, many of you know this gentleman from our church. His name is Thel Boone. I prayed for him earlier. He's got a little procedure coming up this week. Thel Boone has been a a part of this congregation for years and years, uh, but also particularly helpful uh, in the ministry work that we have done in the past and will continue to do in Haiti. Uh, a few years back, as a congregation, we had a, a, a bus, right, Gene? It was a bus that we brought together, packed it full of all sorts of materials and things we need for the mission to Haiti, and through the shipping and transport, the springs on that bus broke. Well, when uh, Thel and the team went down, that's all Thel did for about a week was fix the springs on the bottom of that bus. That's just ordinary guys doing ordinary things. That's what he did. But you know how important that bus is to see God's kingdom grow and expand in Haiti? Hugely important. You can't transport people to projects. You can't transport the materials to do the project without having that bus. And God just uses an ordinary guy, just like Thel, to help establish his kingdom here on earth. Who knew, you know, God could use someone who just turns wrenches? But he can use anybody if he can use a Thel. He can use anybody if he can use me, too. God can use anybody. Here's another story of a, of a good friend of mine. His name is Paul Parrish. Now, Paul, an ordinary guy. Uh, he has a small dairy farm of about, oh, 140 head of dairy cattle, and uh, he milks them, but he's got a few employees that work on his farm with him. Uh, one of those employees is a young man named Alec. Alec was about mm, 15, 16 years old when he began to work for Paul. His mother had also worked for Paul, and he just came along board as well. Uh, Alec, you need to know something, was not, a, a, was not a young man who grew up with any knowledge of Christian faith or belief or anything about, quote, unquote, church. Uh, he didn't really know who Jesus was. I mean, maybe a vague, a vague idea of maybe who, who God was. Uh, not really knowing, you know, what Christmas, Easter, and you know, those things are kind of about. But one, one uh, week, right before Easter, uh, Paul was making his plans and making the schedule for his employees for that week, right before Easter. And Paul always makes it a point to come to Monday, Thursday worship at the church because he usually couldn't come Sunday morning because he was milking cows. He would come Sunday night. But he always tried to be there during the week. And so he made the schedule accordingly. Well, little Alex says, Paul, what, what is Monday, Thursday all about? What is that? 
And now God had just opened the door for Paul to walk right into it and explain to his uh, employee, Alec, what Monday Thursday is. It's, it's about the gathering of God's people to remember the Last Supper in anticipation of Jesus going to the cross and dying for our sins and thus his rising from the dead at Easter. Here God is just using you know, a regular guy. By the world's standards, he's just a simple dairy farmer. But by God's standards, he's a vessel to see his kingdom be established here on earth. So what I'm saying is, it doesn't take heroes. It just takes regular people like James and John, like Peter and Andrew, regular people like us that God uses to establish his kingdom. So my exhortation then is, what are you doing to help establish God's kingdom here on earth? You know, it's easy maybe if you're a nurse at the hospital because we see Jesus healing people all the time. But you know what? We, we need people who are invested and involved in government and I've stopped praying for godly leaders. We need leaders who fear God. They will be godly leaders. We need people just like you to lead government, whether that's in the county or the city or the state. We need those kinds of people. We need people who are going to run their businesses in the fear of the Lord. But seeing their, their business isn't a means of just make, making profit but helping establish God's kingdom here on earth. We need those. We're all called to follow Jesus. So if you're wondering today, you know, what can I do? What can I do to see God's kingdom established here? I want to talk to you. Or, or if you're not going to talk to me, find somebody else who's, who's got wise counsel and talk to them to see God's kingdom established here. So first, I want you to enter into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. Secondly, follow him. Follow him to establish his kingdom here in this world until we see it fulfilled in heaven in the future. Friends, this is God's word for us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. So help us, Lord. You know, whether we work in law enforcement or we work behind the desk at the bank, or, Lord, we're a teacher at the school. Or, Lord, we're a salesman out on the road. Or a student at, behind the desk. Or an athlete on the court. Or a volunteer at the retirement home. Or, Lord, we're just a friendly neighbor. Jesus, use us to see your kingdom come. And see it established here in Sheldon and the surrounding county side, you know, from Sanborn to Granville to Hospers to Ashton to Boyden. Lord, may we see your kingdom come and use us to establish your kingdom here, we pray. In your name we ask. Amen. As we continue to worship through the giving of our offerings, we would like to invite you to Stand again and sing with us.
this morning. It's time to go home. So go with God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen.